Hey guys, so in today's video, we have a compilation of 4 cave diving disaster stories. These are the last 4 diving stories that I uploaded to the channel. So for those who like to watch them in the format of a compilation, this is the video for you. So enjoy. In 1973, when a team of 8 recreational divers were exploring an underwater cavern known as the Shaft, things went horrifyingly wrong. As a result, half of the team didn't make it back to the surface. When I first read this story, I thought this may be one of the worst cave diving disasters I have ever come across on the internet. So I thought, why not tell this tragic tale to you guys as well. So here is the Mount Gambier cave diving disaster. So the shaft is basically a flooded sinkhole discovered in 1938 in a field known as Thompson's Paddock on a farm near Allendale a few kilometers south of Mount Gambier, Australia. When this sinkhole was first found, it appeared to be a little hole in the ground, nothing out of ordinary, but shortly thereafter, it was found to be not so normal as it was actually a shaft opening into a large sinkhole. It is 3 feet wide and leads to a huge underwater cavern. Years later, this sinkhole became known as the Shaft and a famous location among divers for its clear water and interesting internal structure. So the cavern that this hole leads to is comprised of a main chamber. It is about 140 meters long and 80 meters wide. However, if a diver actually jumps into the hole, they won't reach the water right away as the water level actually starts about 7 meters below the ground level which is basically the starting point of the main chamber. Moreover, inside, right when you enter the cavern, there is an intersection one of which extends to the northwest to a depth of about 80 meters and then the other to the east that reaches a maximum depth of 124 meters. So as you can see, the main tunnel kind of splits into two sub-tunnels. However, the full depth, which is 124 meters, is not really the maximum depth as the cave is not fully explored. It is believed that the full depth of the cave is much, much more than just 120 something meters. So just keep that in mind because if you ever got lost, that'll be the end for you. So with that in mind, Despite the hazardousness, on 26th of May 1973, a team of 9 divers arrived at the Mount Gambier in South Australia with the intention of exploring at the shaft. The group was consisted of 3 siblings whose names were Christine, Glenn and Stefan along with their friends named John, Peter, Larry, Gordon and Robert. Though the ninth diver whose name was Joanne later decided to not venture into the cave and instead remained beside the sinkhole preparing hot soup and assisting the group in other ways. They planned to spend two days near Mount Gambier diving in the cave. The first day which was 27th of May went smoothly just as planned. They finished a successful exploration reaching a depth of 46 meters. There, they got to the primary point of interest known as the rock pile. It is a central pile of limestone rubble about 40 meters directly below the sinkhole entrance. So they briefly explored the perimeter of this rock pile before surfacing. So now the first day of diving was over. With their short line already in place, the group planned to return the next morning and continue the cave exploration. So as planned, they arrived at the shaft the next morning. It was 28th of May. Before setting off, they first refilled their 72 cubic feet cylinders. Then they got ready, put on the diving gear and jumped in. With the experience they got from the previous day's dive, they quickly descended to the rock pile with no problems at all. Normally, this rock pile is the boundary for safe recreational diving. Anything beyond that is considered the danger zone. So this is when they should turn back and make the ascent to the surface after exploring around for a little while. Well, they did something different. You see, there was another boundary called the edge. It is far beyond the rock pile. Basically, it is a narrow and downward sloping continuation of the cave. It is on one side of the main chamber, far from natural light that the shaft provides by the sinkhole opening. 
though beyond that point is horrifyingly dark and also it is unexplored and covered in silt and limestone rubble. Just the worst possible conditions for underwater diving. But here's the thing, in most diving accident stories I've told on this channel so far, divers intentionally plan ahead to swim into danger zones, whereas this group did not have a specific plan or a destination to reach, certainly not beyond the edge. Instead, they just went with the flow and spontaneously had decided on the spot to go beyond the rock pile. It seems each member has acted on their own instincts to continue beyond the boundary. You see, out of everyone, Robert was the most experienced in cave diving. And prior to the dive, he had actually given a brief plan as to what to do in the dive. But it was nothing too specific, like never go beyond the rock pile or anything of that sort. He has presumed that everybody like yesterday will turn around at rock pile and surfers. But that didn't happen. Instead, now they are diving in complete darkness beyond the boundary. Some are far ahead in the danger zone, while others are taking it slow, hesitating. Now all while, what any of them did not know was that they have neglected a few key safety protocols much early in the dive. You see, the short line they used the previous day is the one they are using now, as I already mentioned it earlier. However, it does not extend all the way beyond the edge. For some reason, it had never occurred to anyone. And also, no one was equipped with additional air tanks or, at the bare minimum, an air management strategy to reserve some air to use for the extra time that they are about to spend in the water. They simply had no proper approach at all. In risky dives like this, you are supposed to establish specific diving partners, but just like with everything else, they didn't do that either. In other words, they did not use any form of safety guidelines. Now, to make matters worse, if you continue downward even further into the darkness, you are certain to get extreme nitrogen narcosis, especially if the breathing gas is not diluted by helium. Hell, you don't have to go that deep. Even at the depth of the rock pile, the effects of narcosis are pretty impactful. So the group without even knowing actually have been suffering from narcosis since they have passed the rock pile. From every angle, their situation is not getting any better, yet they kept pushing themselves to explore farther into the unknown. It didn't take too long. They found themselves in a fatal situation. Now, the survivors of this incident have their own version of what happened next, so let me tell you what exactly happened once all the different accounts are pieced together. At the rock pile, Robert had already began feeling the effects of nitrogen narcosis. He was an adept diver, so when he saw his depth gauge reading approximately 55 meters, he knew it was about time that he turns back. He was familiar with the symptoms of narcosis as well. He realized spending any longer at the depth that he is at right now will only worsen his condition, so he quickly signaled to the rest of the group that he was returning to the top of the rock pile where he will be safe. The group said okay, but we are going to continue exploring a bit more. Robert then nodded and ascended to the top of the rock pile and stayed there circling around for about 8 minutes while also searching for animal bones to kill the time. Then out of nowhere he saw a torchlight getting brighter towards him. He thought okay by now everyone should surface, so this must be them. But it was only Glenn returning from the direction that others had gone. He was alone, the others were not with him or behind him. Apparently, Glenn also had been monitoring his air like Robert. So, when he knew that it was time to leave, he had tried to tap Christine on her arm to let her know that her time is also up, but the two had gotten separated before he could. When Glenn met Robert at the top of the rock pile, the two decided to continue ascending to the surface together before coming to any consensus on what to do next. Once they clambered out of the water, they learned that they aren't the only ones to surface on time. Larry also had returned. In fact, he was the first one to surface. Then, not even a minute went by, another one surfaced. It was Peter. He almost had run out of air and drowned, but he had gotten lucky. So now, half of the team is safely back on the surface, but four more members are yet to come. They panicked a bit knowing the others must also have low air supplies by this point. 
So Glenn quickly put on a spare air tank and jumped back into the water. He got too anxious thinking the worst as both his sister and brother were among the ones in the water. He rushed and descended to a depth of 69 meters. It's the point where the cliff begins sloping downward and beyond the boundary into the danger zone. There he found Stefan's torch and camera, but not him. A tremendous amount of silt has been stirred up and the visibility was just almost zero. Glenn knew something bad has happened, but he couldn't wait to find out as he was also running out of air, so he had to turn back and return back to the surface. On the way he had to stop to decompress a bit as well. Now I can imagine how he must have felt. It must have been unbearable for him to make the return trip to the surface knowing his two siblings and the two friends are still down there in the water and most likely even dead. By the time he surfaced, there was an ambulance at the sinkhole. Everybody was on edge. They knew they are just waiting for some terrible news. Peter got impatient to find out and returned to the cave for one more look. But just like Glenn, he found nobody, no nothing. At this point, everybody knew that they are not looking for survivors but just a bunch of dead bodies. Reportedly, here's what actually has happened to the victims. Once Christine and Gordon realized that they should surface, they had turned around and attempted to ascend as fast as possible to the rock pile. However, instead diving up along the slope, they had descended down even deeper. They had swam straight down thinking they are actually ascending. They were worried that they'll run out of air, so that kind of clouded their judgment. They got confused and dived the opposite direction. Eventually, they had ended up swimming upward into a dome in the ceiling, which has led to a dead end. Most likely, they have been suffering from nitrogen narcosis while also being surrounded in silt and rubble. They couldn't see anything and failed to find an exit. The two knew that they had no escape, as their air supply was also almost fully exhausted. So the two embraced each other during their final moments as they knew that their death was imminent. So just like that, they died in each other's arms. Larry later had mentioned about seeing two torches frantically moving up and down while he was in the water. It was as if whoever was using the lights was panicking looking for an exit. But it was too late before he had the chance to reach them and help as they had swum the wrong direction at a higher speed. He believes that it was Christine and Gordon. But that was the last time the two had been seen alive. When rescue divers went searching for the corpses, these two were the first ones to be found. At the time of their discovery, they were still in the position of holding each other. Similarly, John also had suffered a gruesome fate. With the effects of nitrogen narcosis, he also had swam strongly downward further into the cave. With the confusion and disorientation he got from narcosis, he hadn't realized that he was actually swimming to his death. His body was located about 6 meters further down where he was last seen and was at the greatest depth of all the discovered corpses. Finally, the last victim, Glenn's brother Stefan. Though in his case, it's a little different. Unlike others, he had actually found the right direction to ascend. But unfortunately, he has still gotten lost beneath the cave ceiling shortly before the surviving divers surfaced. Although his torch and camera were found deep at the base of the rock pile, his body was found under an overhang at a depth of only about 15 meters. So remember when Glenn jumped in for the second time to look for Stefan and others? He must have dived by Stefan's corpse as it was hidden under the overhang. Compared to other victims, not much is known about Stefan's final moments. But it's clear that he had tried his best to surface as he was only 15 meters below the surface. So after many many failed attempts, rescue divers finally recovered the corpses. It was not a regular recovery operation as even the most pro rescue divers had an extremely difficult time locating the bodies. In fact, it took them almost an year to discover all four corpses. The cause of death in all four was found to be lack of air with terminal drowning. So all in all, what seemed like a simple and fun dive turned out being one of the most tragic diving accidents in the history of cave diving world. To this day, the shaft is known as the bottomless hole. 
The other end of the hole or the cavern has never been explored. People say it has no end. The deeper you dive, the more endless it becomes. All you will find beyond the edge is just darkness and death. The ones who are curious enough to venture into such an environment is more likely to not return. The best example is this, the fate of Christine, Gordon, Stephen and John. So that was their story. There's a lesson we all could learn from their ordeal. If you've made it this far in the video, I hope in your own ways you have already interpreted that lesson. On Christmas Day morning in 2013, Darren Spivory and his teenage son Dylan Sanchez nervously head out to the unnerving eagle's nest sinkhole. There, they wanted to test out their new diving gear they got for Christmas. Hours went by. Darren and Dylan were not home. Holly, Darren's fiancée, could not reach the duo. Growing more and more anxious, she eventually called the police and reported the two as missing. Though what really has happened to Darren and Dylan is something that not even in her worst nightmares would she ever have believed. So today, I'm going to tell you what happened to them. The Eagle's Nest is considered one of the most hazardous caves located in Florida. From the shore, it appears to be a normal pond, but beneath the surface, it's formed in the shape of a sink with a long and rocky drain that plunges into a system of underwater passages reaching a depth of 300 feet. So far, 11 people have died trying to dive in the cave since 1981. In fact, the cave was considered so hazardous that a ban was imposed from 1999 to 2003 to basically prevent people from dying. But later, with the pursuance of many divers, the diving site was reopened. But still, if you visit the location today, you'll see many warning signs telling you not to dive unless you truly know what you're doing. Plus, inside the cave, there's a plaque telling you something similar and more sinister alongside a picture of a grim reaper. Basically, you must be a certified diver to venture into this sinkhole. Otherwise, there's a good chance that you won't make it out of the cave alive. On 25th of December in 2013, 35-year-old Darren and his 15-year-old son Dylan entered the bone-chilling spring waters. Both could not wait to use their new diving gear. When they arrived at the sinkhole, there was a hunter nearby who saw the father and son gearing up at about 11 am. Then the duo lowered themselves into the water one by one. So their journey began. All the while, the hunter went about his death not thinking much as he sees divers all the time by the sinkhole. However, what shocked him was when he returned back to the site again at about 6.30 pm, a long time has passed. There, he saw the car that Darren and Dylan came in. It was still parked where it was in the morning. Something seemed very wrong, he thought to himself. On the other hand, by 7 pm, Holly, Darren's fiancée, also figured the same as she didn't hear from Darren and Dylan the whole day. She got worried and called some of her friends and family members to tell them what was going on. She said she tried calling Darren many times, but none of the calls were picked up. Holly wasn't a driver, so she simply didn't know what to do. But finally, after a while, she decided to call 911. So she did. By then, it was 7.30 p.m. Right away, Hernando County Sheriff's Office responded and sent out certified underwater emergency recovery divers. When everybody got to the sinkhole, they saw the parked car. They naturally knew the two probably haven't climbed out of the water and that something must have gone very wrong during the dive. So a search was launched at 8.30 p.m. Everyone knew that they will not find the father and son alive. It was already too late for that. According to the investigation carried out for this case, here's what has happened. The two entered the cave and gradually began their descent. It seems they have taken their time enjoying the new gear and the beauty underwater. After a while, the pair have descended to a depth of about 233 feet. Their dive computers and gauges revealed that. However, by this point, they have spent too long just for their descent. So unknowingly, they have almost fully exhausted their air supplies. When they learned this, they had no choice but to turn back and ascend as fast as humanly possible to get back to their spare tanks which were placed at a depth of 130 feet. They nearly made it. Darren was the first to get to the tanks but that didn't mean they were out of the woods yet. You see, because they had gotten to an insane depth which was 233 feet, they had to spend an extra hour in the water for decompression. Decompression sickness could be a fatal condition if not handled appropriately. 
So to do that, during the rest of the ascent, they must make several stops along the way to let their bodies release certain gases that they absorbed into their bloodstream during the descent. Also that way they could get used to the change in pressure as the surface is getting closer. But even with these spare tanks, they do not have sufficient air to spend an additional hour in the water. So their only option was to skip that hour to decompress. Right? Well, not quite. If they swam straight up to the surface without stopping, they won't make it to the surface as decompression sickness will form bubbles in their blood with excruciating muscle and joint pains. In severe cases, a diver even could get strokes or heart failure. But that was only half of their problems. They have made another mistake. Well, you see, when you dive to a great depth, generally anything over 180 feet, it is a must to use some variation of trimix air. It is basically a mix of oxygen, helium, and nitrogen. Divers use this mix of gas to reduce nitrogen narcosis and oxygen toxicity, more conditions that literally could kill you underwater. But Darren and Dylan were not using a certain form of trimix air, they were just using simple compressed air. Now, definitely, that is not usable for the deepest section of the eagle's nest. And by this point, they have already been in that section of the cave. It is only a matter of time until they start feeling the effects of either nitrogen narcosis or oxygen toxicity. Several potential health conditions, lack of air, panicking, decrease in temperature, darkness, low visibility, too many problems. If all these tell us anything, it is the fact that these father-son duo were clearly underprepared for their dive. If you are a diver that is going to explore a cave that requires trimix air, that normally means that you are a certified diver with enough training and knowledge to embark on deep dives. But Darren was not a certified diver, however he was at least an adult compared to Dylan who was just a teenager with no training whatsoever. He was certainly not ready for any form of underwater diving. However, despite many challenges, they ascended to where they had placed their spare tanks. So with them, they began the rest of the ascent thinking they will make it. But against so many odds, in reality, it was impossible. So at a certain point, they completely ran out of air to breathe. It is not clear whether they had also started suffering from any physical conditions like nitrogen narcosis or decompression sickness. The first one to empty their tanks was Dylan. So his father Darren was quick to take action. He used a long breathing hose he had to let his son breathe from his tank. By this point, Darren knew they both will die. It is only a matter of time. He was just prolonging his son's death first by giving him some air. Eventually, they both ran out of air and passed away in the cold and dark eagle's nest sinkhole. So the two began their dive at about 11 am in the Christmas morning and by 8.30 pm on the same day, everybody knew of their fate and began their search. So not too long after the recovery operation was started, the corpses of the father and son were found. The same father and son who were completely healthy and fine in that Christmas morning were all of a sudden dead by the evening of the same day. This incident sparked rage in the diving community. Most underwater divers are trained to be rational and safe. They would never consider going beyond their limits. Darren and Dylan should never have entered the eagle's nest. Although Darren was a great father and never meant to put his son in harm's way, he overlooked the dangers of the underwater environment and ultimately meant his end along with his son. Bushman's Hole is a death wish. It is almost 1000 feet deep. In fact, more people have walked on the moon than having explored and gotten to the bottom of this unfathomably deep sinkhole. It is that life-threatening. In today's story, two divers attempt to descend to this sinkhole's maximum depth only to realize that they are simply not going to survive in it. It was truly a horrifying incident. So I'm gonna tell you about it. Here is the story of the Bushman's Hole cave diving disaster. Bushman's Hole is a deep submerged freshwater sinkhole in the northern Cape province of South Africa. With a depth of over 900 feet, this is a body of water that no novice underwater diver can venture into and survive. A diver would have to descend for a very very long time into the dark and endless abyss to get to the bottom. Now you might be wondering, who in the world would want to explore this sinkhole? Well, I can't answer that because I wouldn't explore it either myself. But Don Shirley and Dave Shaw had their reasons. It all started in 2004, when they explored Bushman's Hole for the first time and came across the remains of a dead diver. 
You see, almost a decade ago, on December 17th of 1994, a young man named Dion Dreyer from Johannesburg, South Africa, was carrying out a practice dive with a team of technical divers in Bushman's Hall. The 20-year-old diver had been invited to team up with the South African Diving Organization and then was asked to join a particular dive reaching 492 feet in Bushman's Hall. On that ominous day, he ventured into the sinkhole, but unlike everybody else, he didn't make it back to the surface. His fellow dive buddies stated that he was lost during the ascent back to the surface. They believed during the ascent, he either developed oxygen toxicity or hypercapnia. Both are fatal conditions. But again, one could argue that developing a condition like that mustn't be a surprise in a deep sinkhole like Bushman's Hole. Well, I think we all could agree with that. So, later Dion's parents hired divers left and right to retrieve their son's body, but not even the most pro-rescue divers could find the corpse. There was no sign of it. Only Dion's helmet was found. After countless attempts, the family gave up. They were devastated and eventually left after placing a plaque on a rock wall near the mouth of Bushman's Hall as a remembrance to their son. This tragedy also devastated the diving community, especially considering the fact that almost always when divers die underwater, their bodies get recovered. Sadly, Dion's case was different. He got lost and hidden in the Bushman's Hall for many years. Everybody gave up on discovering him. It was simply an impossible task. Ultimately, Dion's family and friends also accepted their loved one's tragic fate and decided to let him rest in the dark and deep Bushman's Hall. At least, that is what they thought, until Dave and Don on that fateful day in October of 2004 explored the Bushman's Hall. The two divers had spent 9 hours and 40 minutes in their dive. During this long and exhausting exploration, Dave came across something, or rather you could say his light did. It was an old wetsuit filled with human remains, basically a bunch of bones. Dave instinctively swam towards it and took a good long look. He thought it makes total sense that rescue divers would abandon their recovery mission to find a corpse when it's lost at a depth like this. Right away it occurred to him who this was, the lost diver mentioned on the plaque near the entrance. So he quickly tried to pull the body free but it was stuck in years of built up mud and silt. It only elevated his heart rate, so he calmed down and stopped trying. Finding this body was not in their dive plan. Both divers knew if they tried, it would only put their lives at a risk. Running out of air and a number of health conditions would have been obvious consequences. So, both divers left the body there, feeling pretty upset. They kind of lost the one chance they had to take this diver's body back to the surface and finally let his family and friends find some peace with a proper funeral after all these years. But just because they failed doesn't mean they gave up on it. In fact, that whole ordeal gave the two divers a new purpose, a new mission to retrieve Dion one way or another. So once they returned to the surface that day, they immediately contacted Dion Dreyer's parents. The pair gave the news of the discovery of their son's remains. They said, we are going to retrieve your son's body. Then the two almost immediately began planning the recovery operation. It was no ordinary dive. Their plan was to dive 900 feet. Every 33 feet down they dive, the riskiness they are exposed to practically doubles in Bushman's Hole. Even the air they breathe at such an incredible depth can lead their bodies to develop deadly health conditions. For example, if they breathe too much nitrogen, it could put their minds on a euphoric and drunk-like state where they would even forget they are underwater. They might even throw out their mouthpieces thinking they are on the surface. It is that dangerous. Also, another thing Dave and Don must keep in their minds is to never panic or breathe too heavily trying to free Dion's body. If they ever did, they could pass out and drown. Either way, they were bound to struggle a bit as the body is stuck in deep mud. Not only that, there is the elephant in the room, which is decompression sickness. You see, on the way back to the surface, the pair must not rush. They have to stop multiple times along the way for their bodies to release the gases they absorbed into their blood during the descent and the time spent at the bottom. If these gases, especially nitrogen, were not decompressed properly, they will form bubbles in their blood. Then they will block the blood flow and lead to a lot of fatal health conditions. One, they might not be able to move due to joint and muscle pain. And two, also the worst case scenario, they could have heart failures or strokes. All in all, these decompression stops will add extra time to the overall dive. 
Another issue they will face is the pitch black darkness. This sinkhole is so large and deep that not even the most powerful flashlights are effective. If they shine the light any direction, it will disappear. The darkness will eat the light. Basically, the point is that diving into Bushman's hole is truly a death wish if you weren't prepared to deal with all these complications. This is exactly why Dave and Don spent a good amount of time planning. Unlike their previous dive where they explored around in the Bushman's hole, they are going to free and recover a body stuck in mud. For that, they had to use advanced equipment. You see, unlike for recreational diving, Dave and Don this time had to use a closed circuit system. It includes rebreathers and some other gear that allows some or all of their breathing gas to be recycled. This is used in technical diving. It will help the two last long in the water with less air tanks. By less air tanks, I mean they still have to carry at least about 6 air tanks. Alright, now that you guys have an idea of the real gravity of a dive in Bushman's Hole, I hope you guys understand the complexity of this recovery operation. So with that said, finally, the day of the notorious dive came. It was January 8th of 2005, a little over two months after their previous dive when they initially located Dion's body. For this dive though, they had next level pre-planning. They wanted to minimize the risk as much as possible. They had 35 backup air tanks placed in the water already. That is more than enough air for Don, Dev and even other supporting divers that get into water. Surviving a rebreather failure would have been easy with that many tanks. They also set up a winch system so that divers can be hauled on a stretcher up the cliffs of the sinkhole into a decompression chamber. Moreover, in case there were any medical emergencies, Don also recruited a doctor to stay standby. So after this extremely thorough preparation, they dropped the short line down into the depths of the hole. It was early morning, 6.15 am to be specific. So Don and Dave along with their supporting divers entered the waters of the Bushman's Hole. Dave set off first as he was the diver planned to go to the deepest of the cave and free Dion's body. Then after 14 minutes, Don followed behind. By this point, Dave should have gotten to Dion's body and even almost done with freeing it. So Don expected to meet Dave with Dion's body at their rendezvous point of 1725 feet. That is almost equivalent to the height of the Eiffel Tower. Now if the rendezvous point is that deep, imagine the bottom of the cave where Dave is at by this point. That takes a different kind of tolerance to fear of dying. But well, however, at around 500 feet during Don's descent, he saw Dave's light a couple hundred feet down, but it was remaining still. In fact, a little too still for a diver who's ascending with a dead body to a rendezvous point. You see, before the dive, Don asked Dave whether he's sure about going to the deepest of the hole alone. Dave then said yes, but if he ever wanted help, he would say no. In cave diving, when a diver flashes their light or waves it around, that normally means distress signal or in other words asking for help. But right now, the flash wasn't even moving. Also, Don didn't see any bubbles coming from Dave. They were very bad signs. He knew right away that something must have gone terribly wrong. By this point, it has been over 20 minutes. Don was confident that there was no room for any errors with the amount of planning and preparation they did. But he instinctively knew that Dave must need help despite him not showing any signals for help. Nonetheless, Don still thought to himself that Dave must be fine. But in reality, a motionless diver at the depth that Dave is at must always mean dead. Day before this dive, Dave said to Don and all other supporting divers that the most important person on this dive is you. If you have a problem, deal with your problem and forget about me. It's better to have one person dead than two. In fact, even Don himself said to everyone, if Dave doesn't make it back, if I don't make it back, we stay there. That's the end of the story. We don't want to be recovered. But well, Don never really would have expected such a scenario to really come true. But it is happening now. So against his own advice, he went to help Dave. He couldn't just leave his friend behind in the depths of a sinkhole. He at least wanted to see whether there was anything he could do to help. So Don descended past his planned depth and reached 833 feet. That was the deepest he had ever gone in a dive. Then he suddenly heard this intense cracking noise. It was his rebreather controller on his forearm. It had been exploded due to the fierce pressure at the incredible depth that he is at right now. 
Although this sounds like a terrifying thing to happen underwater, it wasn't a big deal to Don. He was trained to deal with these types of situations. He knew precisely what to do. He had to manually add oxygen to his gas mixture. When I said gas mixture, it means the type of gas used in this dive. In technical diving, divers use Trimix Air. It is a mix of oxygen, helium and nitrogen. Based on the depth of a dive, divers change the variation of these three gases so they can survive underwater for a certain period of time. Now don't have to manually add oxygen to this mixture. However, there was a specific amount to add, but Don didn't know how much he was adding. In fact, he added too much, which became a really bad problem. So he can no longer reach there. You see, when a diver descends past 180 feet and he is inhaling too much oxygen, it could lead to oxygen toxicity. It is a deadly condition that no diver would want to experience underwater. So now, Dave is in grave danger. He had two choices. He could either try to reach Dave and most likely suffer the same fate or he could attempt to save himself. He told himself, okay, Dave might make it back. He's either dead or he's working his way back. But all I could deal with right now is what is right in front of me. So he took the most sensible decision which is to ascend and not die. But the problem now is that he can ascend too quickly. He had to stop for decompression. Every minute he spent at this depth, a full hour of decompression time was added to the ascent. All in all, he had 10 hours of diving ahead of him by this point. The situation is getting much worse. The truth is that the chances of Don surviving is pretty damn low, considering all the complications he's facing. It didn't take too long for him to suffer from the effects of oxygen toxicity. He was feeling dizzy and started passing out. He lost all his senses. He had absolutely no sense of down, up, sideways or anything. To make matters worse, he lost the grip of his guideline. He kept passing out, waking up, passing out and waking up swimming in these little circles, spinning around trying to find his guideline, because the line was Don's only ticket out of the sinkhole. At this depth, in pitch black darkness, he couldn't see even a little glimpse of light coming from the entrance. The only range of view was what is right in front of his flashlight. At this point, the only way he could survive is by luck. So finally, Don's light caught a hold of the guideline by complete accident. Yeah, he got lucky and quickly grabbed it, though he was almost unconscious while all this was happening. Then it got even worse, he started vomiting in between breaths. As an experienced diver, he kept calm though and eventually stabilized himself. After that, he gradually began ascending back towards the entrance. I'm telling you, that must have felt like a ride in hell. Nonetheless, after many painful hours, he got pretty close to the surface where he also met up with one of the support divers. Using a waterproof pencil and a slate made for underwater communication, Don wrote, I'm okay, and Dave's not coming back. No matter how hopeful and positive he wanted to be, he had to face the harsh reality. If Dave was ever alive, he would have gotten here by now, but he hasn't, Don thought to himself. He was exhausted that he couldn't even move, so the support driver quickly helped him make the last bit of the ascent. So finally, Don along with the support diver emerged from Bushman's hole after a 12 and a half hour dive. It was 7 pm by this point. He was winched up the cliff face and right away put in the decompression chamber before being taken to a hospital in Johannesburg the next morning. Although Don did the impossible and survived, Dave didn't. He did not emerge from Bushman's hole that day. It was clear that he was dead. Don was treated for two weeks straight before he could think clearly to form a sentence. He suffered a great deal of physical and mental damage. His balance was impaired permanently, but here's what's truly surprising. After a few more months of recovery, he actually went cave diving again, almost like nothing happened. But as for Dave, well, we all know of his fate. A week after the incident, his body was found. It had floated up and discovered about 66 feet below the surface stuck under an underwater ceiling. With Dave, there was a body bag entangled in a line. Inside it was Dion Dreyer. So ultimately, Dave actually completed his mission. He and Don recovered Dion's body and brought it back to the surface to his family. But sadly, in the process, Dave died. However, what happened to him remained a mystery until his last recorded video of the dive was uncovered.
In it there they were, Dave's final moments. So here's what has happened to him. First Dave enters the hall. You can hear the short line squeak through his fingers as he slides down. About 11 minutes into the video, Dave reaches the bottom of the cave, more than one and a half minutes earlier than planned. As soon as he hits the bottom, he gets to Dion and pulled out the body bag to get to work. Dave begins slipping the body bag over Dion's legs. As he is focused on doing that, he accidentally starts up quite a bit of silt. So Dave then waits for the water to clear up. And just like that it clears. When visibility becomes good, he sees Dion's body floating creepily in front of him. It seems Dion wasn't a complete skeletal as everyone had thought. Instead, the corpse had mummified into a soap-like composition that gives it mass and neutral buoyancy. The body was not supposed to float. Everybody theorized that it would have been to the ground, but now it is floating, which is a problem. Because when the body is constantly moving in the water, it is much more difficult to slip the body back over it. In the video, it is clear that Dave struggles and fumbles. He then lets out an audible grunt of effort. Dave is getting more and more distressed by the second as he begins breathing faster and louder. You can hear it in the video. This is when Dave should have left the body but he doesn't. He is too determined to finish the job. Dave keeps trying to control the body but what he does next made things 10 times worse. He lets go of his lie to use both hands. Dion keeps turning and rolling in front of him resisting Dave's attempts to get him into the bag. This struggle goes on for about 2 minutes and his line is seemingly everywhere. It snacks on his light and Dave poses to clear it. Everything happening right now is just wrong. Dave is making fatal mistakes left and right. A cave diver must never let go of his gear. This was very uncharacteristic of Dave. Don as he was watching the video got super angry that Dave was doing the worst possible things in such a life and death kind of a situation. In this video, then it looks like Dave is acting confused. He is working at the height of his torso instead of his feet. His body movements are peculiar as if he doesn't know what he is supposed to do. After about 4 minutes, Dave pulls out his scissors to try to cut away Dion's dive tanks as he slid the corpse into the bag. So miraculously, it was done, Dion's in the body bag finally. But the real problem was only starting at this point. Dave's heart rate continues to increase and his breathing becomes even louder and faster. Then suddenly, he loses his footing on the sloping bottom. He scrambles back to the body in a cloud of silt. The grunts of effort, despairing little bursts of sound are painfully frequent. Dave is suffering from extreme nitrogen narcosis. According to the support diver Peter, at this point, you only focus on one thing. You don't focus on the dive anymore. The one thing becomes everything. And I think with Dave it became the body, the body, the body. You can tell Dave has completely lost his senses in the video. His main focus was not to save himself. His focus was on what he is seeing right in front of him, Deandre's body. Finally though, out of sheer luck or whatever it was, Dave decides it's time to ascend now that Dion's body is in the bag. But right as he tries to swim up with the body bag, he snacks on something. Dave's moments become awkward and his breathing gets worse. His desperation is pretty apparent in this part of the video. What he got snacked on is Dion's dive tanks that are sitting at the bottom. He tries to escape but he just can't. He can't do anything at this point. Every breath he takes now sounds like a sharp grunt. Dave tries to swim up but gets anchored by the weight of Dion's body. He still had the scissors on his hand, so he tried cutting himself out of the entangled lines, but simply nothing happens. It looks like he cut something, but nothing really gets cut. His heart rate keeps accelerating, and he sounds like he is gasping. When Don and Peter were watching this video, they literally turned the sound off. It was that painful for them to listen to it. Eventually, about 21 minutes into the ordeal, Dev passes out due to the high amounts of carbon dioxide in his lungs. At this point, it is clear he's dying. And just like that, about a minute later, there were no moments. Dev Shaw passed away. 
Nuno Gomez was one of the support divers with Don and Dave that day, and he's the last person alive today out of everyone of the group. He reminisced what it's like to dive in the Bushman's hole. He said Dave could have survived that day, but while you're in the depths of Bushman's hole, you don't think of a new plan even if it means getting to save yourself. It doesn't work like that. Your mind is clouded. You cannot do it. However, he clearly honors Dave. It was a noble dive that took a lot of courage. After all, he did complete his final task. He brought DeAndre's body back to the surface. But the question is, was it worth it? Well, I'll leave the answer to that question to you guys. His name was Chris Lemons and he laid unconscious on the North Sea bed almost 100 meters below the surface. He accepted his fate to spend his last minutes in the dark and cold waters of the North Sea. And in today's video, I'm gonna tell you about his story. Chris worked in the North Sea, diving from his ship in the diving bell, repairing oil rig structures. Like always, it was a usual day in September 2012. At least normal C4 or scuba diver that is. But even for Chris, he never would have expected the day to end the way it did. That day, Chris along with his two colleagues, Dave Yusa and Duncan Alcock were lowered 91 meters in their diving bell to fix a pipe on the seabed at the Huntington oil field east of Peterhead in Aberdeenshire. At the time, the ship was enduring 35 knot winds but according to experts, it was standard weather for that time of the year. So Chris and his two friends did not waste a single second and got to work as they were in deep and dark sea. Some time went by, all three divers suddenly heard an alarm. By this point, the trio had been communicating with the diver supervisor, Craig, up in the ship through an earpiece in their helmets. At first, they thought it was just a test as they would hear alarms often in their dive control. But this time, the sound was instantaneously followed by Craig asking Chris and the other two divers to get out of the structure, get on top of it and back to the diving bell as quickly as they could. Chris could tell from the urgency in Craig's voice that, that this was not a drill and this was something deadly serious. While Chris and the other two were in the water, what they didn't know was that the ship was actually moving away as the computer that kept the ship in position had failed. This meant bad news. You see, when divers are lowered to an extreme depth in a diving bell, they are still kept attached to the ship by a cord. So, to Chris and his two friends, the ship drifting away meant them also being dragged away with it because they were attached to the ship with the cord. However, with this whole ordeal, Chris specifically had an even worse problem. His cord got snagged on part of the metal structure. It made everything 100 times more deadly for him. That cord was not only the tether back to the diving bell and the ship, but it also provided Chris or any diver for that matter with breathing gas, hot water to keep the suits warm in the 3 degree C as well as light and electricity. It was also his only way to communicate with the ship, so right away he knew he was in grave danger. He basically had 8000 tons of a ship pulling against him. He was essentially an anchor to that in the bottom. He had no escape. Dave and Duncan could not do anything. The cord was pulled so tight, it was bending a stainless steel rack off the wall in the diving bell. Not long passed, first, the communication cable snapped. Then the gas hose stretched to a point Chris had nothing to breathe. All this was happening within a matter of 30 seconds. You see, when divers go to these depths to work at oil rigs, they almost never carry anything because the cord provides them with everything. It was the same with Chris, except he was carrying a bailout bottle. It is a set of air cylinders on his back to use in an emergency situation. But due to the depth that Chris is at, all the air would run out almost immediately. Chris realized at max he would have about 5-6 to six minutes of gas in the tanks. And that was nowhere enough for him to survive. The gas hose is too stretched and therefore he can't breathe and that was his problem. So now that there is no air, Chris had no option but to use the bailout gas. So he opened the supply on his back. Shortly thereafter, the cord fully snapped like a shotgun going off. Chris fell down to the floor of the sea. A crew member back on the ship pulled up the cord and shouted, 
I've lost my diver, I've lost my diver. All while Chris was falling almost 100 meters down to the seabed in scary darkness. He couldn't see a thing down there because remember he lost not only his air supply but also electricity and light. By this point it was about 2 in the morning. The nightmare was only getting worse though Chris somehow managed to find the structure they had been doing the repair on and found a way to climb up on it. But still, the diving bell wasn't there and so are Dave and Duncan. They also have disappeared. By this point, Chris already has used up about 2-3 to three minutes of his gas. He told himself, so this is where I would end my days. Chris felt intense fear and panic. He was on a countdown and it was counting really, really fast. Once he accepted that there was no hope of survival, he told himself, I am powerless to do anything to save myself. Chris was feeling a great deal of sadness and at the same time a strong disbelief that he was going to die. How did I find myself in this dark, sad and horrible place? He thought of everybody at home and the chaos he would cause. But all while what he didn't know was that Dave and Duncan didn't really disappear. In fact, they along with the whole crew of the ship had been searching for him the whole time. Though they already had presumed Chris might be dead, but still they at least wanted to find the corpse. So they were putting superhuman effort to locate him. So miraculously, Dave and Duncan found him unconscious on the structure. By the time of his discovery, his bailout gas had fully run out. He should have died, but he didn't. When Duncan gave him a few breaths of air, he spluttered to life. It had been 35 minutes since Chris had turned on his emergency air supply by this point. So that means if his bailout air ran out within 5 to 6 minutes, for almost half an hour he didn't have any air to breathe. But then how did he survive? With nothing to breathe for that long, Chris could easily have suffered brain damage, but he was completely fine. Chris believes the freezing water might have had something to do with slowing down his body functions. Or the gas they breathe underwater might be the reason as it has a higher concentration of oxygen. He thinks it may have saturated his tissues and cells to allow him to survive. Well, all in all, how he survived is a bit unclear. And maybe even a mystery. Nonetheless, what's important is that he survived and was safely rescued back to the ship. Though about 3 weeks later, he returned to diving in the sea again with his team as if nothing happened. You might think he is crazy for this, well that was his job, he did it for a living and not for fun. No matter the riskiness, sometimes people wouldn't quit a job that easy. Plus it was not his fault, it was an unforeseen situation. Nobody could have predicted a computer failure literally at the time when divers were in the water. But luckily, after that day, Chris never experienced anything life-threatening. In fact, a few months after this incident, he married his fiancée, Morag Martin. To this day, Morag says she is grateful to Dave and Duncan. She said, my stomach still turns to hear the story. I came ridiculously close to losing him and being robbed of the life that we were going to have. I'm extremely grateful to both of them. So thanks to his two buddies, Chris survived an ordeal that could have easily killed him. Alright guys, with that we have gotten to the end of this story compilation. What do you guys think about these tragic incidents? Let me know in the comment section. Also if you like dark and horror storytelling videos like this one, please consider subscribing. I would really appreciate that. Alright then, thank you for watching and with another story, I will see you guys soon. Until then, stay safe out there and goodbye.